Hello, my name is Jeff Farbman from the Wallace Center at Winrock International. Welcome to the National Good Food Network webinar, Pathways to Food Hub Success, Financial Benchmark Metrics and Measurements for Regional Food Hubs. This webinar was supported by the Risk Management Agency of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. There is tremendous interest in food hubs since they are such an important factor in re-regionalizing our food system. These are triple bottom line businesses interested in social, environmental, and economic impacts. The purpose of the first, this first ever U.S. Food Hub benchmarking study is to look closely at Food Hub finances to see if they can do well while doing good. So let me uh, start with a technical orientation. Your webinar screen should look like this, the slide presentation on the left and the control panel on the right. Note that the software sometimes collapses the control panel to make it take up less of your screen. If that happens, just hit the little orange arrow, look on the extreme right side of your screen to find the collapsed control panel. Uh, we suggest that you keep this visible so that you can see any written answers to questions and submit questions of your own. In the control panel, select the view menu, you can deselect hide control panel in that view menu to prevent the panel from collapsing again. Over in the control panel is a questions box. You are muted during the presentation, so please use the questions box to type in your questions for our presenters. I'll be asking as many questions of our presenters as possible in the questions and answers section, but I encourage you to get your questions in whenever they occur to you. We often get asked if this webinar will be uh, archived, if the recording will be archived. Uh, it will be. Uh, go to ngfn.org slash webinars. You'll also find all of the previous NGFN webinars archived there. If you've missed any, that's the place to go. And it's a great place to direct colleagues with whom you'd like to share this present presentation or others. And finally, I'd like to encourage you to complete our post-webinar survey. It takes just a minute and really helps us to continue to improve our webinars and our outreach. Let me talk about the uh, Wallace Center and uh, the National Good Food Network. The Wallace Center is a business unit of Winter Winrock International and is the host of the NGFN webinar series. The Wallace Center has been a leading organization in the movement for a more sustainable and equitable food system for over 25 years. Today, the center supports entrepreneurs and communities as they build a new 21st century food system that is healthier for people, the environment, and the economy. The center serves the growing community of civic, business, and philanthropic organizations involved in building a new good food system in the United States. In particular, we're focused on advancing regional collaborative efforts around the country to move good food, healthy, fair, green, affordable food beyond the direct marketing realm into larger scale wholesale channels. The National Good Food Network, or NGFN, is an initiative of the Wallace Center. It is structured as a network of networks ensuring efficient flow of information and innovation from boots on the ground projects to the national level and back down to the grassroots level across the nation. The Wallace Center coordinates and supports the network. Our goals are to work with the growers to ensure there's an abundant supply of good food to meet the high to meet the high consumer demand for the product, to collect and disseminate the best models, stories, methods, and outcomes, and to ensure that policymakers are informed about the wonderful successes our network partners have had so that we can continue to increase support for regional healthy food. You can learn more about the great work the National Good Food Network does on our website, ngfn.org. We have a library of fantastic resources for scaling up good food, especially of, our note, of note is our section on food hubs. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. And, uh, Always feel free to email us, contact at ngfn.org. So uh, let me jump right into the, to the meat um, and uh, introduce you to the team. Uh, I will uh, make all the in uh, introductions uh, up front and then step out of the way and let them present straight through. And I'll be back to moderate the questions uh, section. Gary Madison works for the Farm Credit Council in Washington, D.C., which is the trade organization of the Farm Credit System. Farm Credit is a nationwide network of borrower-owned lending institutions providing credit for the nation's farmers and ranchers. As the vice president for young, beginning, small farmer programs and outreach, Gary seeks to identify and meet the needs of the next generation of farmers and ranchers as part of Farm Credit's enduring mission of service to agriculture and rural America. Until recently, Gary was a small farmer operating a wholesale greenhouse business in New Hampshire, including raising cattle for the local freezer beef market. He holds bachelor's degrees in agronomy and biology from the University of Connecticut. Chad Gerenser is a program associate for Morse Marketing Connections, a partner in the NGFN Food Hub collaboration. Prior to joining MMC, Chad worked for a Fortune 500 company where his client base included companies from uh, energy, technology, and automotive sectors. 
Chad graduated from the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business in 2008 with a BA in Business Administration. Aaron Pirro is a farm business consultant and vice president for Farm Credit East, the Northeast's leading financial services cooperative for agriculture. Her work is centered on successfully helping customers analyze their business from many angles in order to pinpoint methods for improving their profitability. In addition, Aaron leads First Pioneer's Agricultural Retail Benchmark, which is a comprehensive program of data analysis and benchmark reporting, as well as a customized seminar and consulting meeting for owners of farm markets, green garden centers, nurseries, wineries, and other ag retail businesses. Erin received her undergraduate degree in resource economics and her master's degree in agricultural economics from the University of Connecticut. Her family farm raises and markets Connecticut-grown lamb and provides shearing services in southern New England. So uh, let's uh, start out with Gary. Thanks, Kev. Uh, just so we have a common starting point, this is the working definition we used for a food hub. Note that it is quite broad in its scope. For instance, there's no minimum or maximum size to a food hub, nor is there a prescription that a food hub has to be a for-profit business, which allows this definition to include nonprofit entities. One notable characteristic that distinguishes a food hub from a produce wholesaler is that the mission intent is expressed, that a food hub has a sense of purpose to strengthen producer capacity and increase access to markets. Also, a food hub sources food locally and regionally, and the story of the food, the producer, and even the production methods, all of that stays with the product so that the final consumer has access to that information. Farm Credit initiated this study for several reasons. First, we're interested in how food hubs provide more opportunities for farmers to sell their products. We've noted the increasing importance of local foods as a marketing channel for farm producers such as farmers markets or farm stands or CSAs. Food hubs are a logical extension of the wholesale side of the local food sector, a way for local foods to become more available to more people in more places. Beyond providing more market access for farmers, it's evident that food hubs are effective in establishing a broader relationship between a community and the agricultural producers that feed it. This is good for farmers and consumers and communities and for the future of agriculture. We understand that uh, being a food hub does not mean following a strictly defined business model or distribution model, that a food hub can in fact sell to businesses, to retail consumers, or a combination of both. Farm Credit East has extensive experience in creating benchmarking programs. The benchmarking groups listed here are all farmer-driven, meaning the farmers participate because they see a benefit to their own operational success by doing so, and they also realize they're contributing to the greater good of their sector. Benchmarks are important because they set expectations for farm business performance. Now, in the area of local foods, there's a tremendous lack of data. Uh, part of the reason for this is that USDA and other data collectors have traditionally focused on what farm product is being sold, such as uh, is it grain or eggs or beef or watermelons. Um, understanding local food systems requires a shift in collecting data to be able to track sales, volume, price, and other activity through a marketing channel that we call local foods. So understanding how this market sector works is important not just to farmers and food hub operators, but also to lenders like Farm Credit who need to understand where the risks are for the individual farmer, for each business function in the value chain, and for the sector as a whole. So we expect that consumer-driven agriculture, uh, consumer-driven demand for local foods will continue to grow in economic significance for farmers and in cultural significance to communities, which will also benefit farmers in the long run. So a typical benchmarking study collects actual financial results as well as operational measures, such as, uh, for instance, how many miles were driven by the delivery trucks or how many people were employed. This information is compared to similar businesses and then analyzed to determine a range of performance. So the typical benchmarking study process is collect, compare, and then analyze. Um, here's a list of what Farm Credit 
expect to accomplish in this food hub benchmarking study. And you'll see that the, the first challenge in analysis of the data is to figure out what things should be measured that will yield the best insights as to how the food hub business works. By way of analogy, if you uh, want to understand why your favorite baseball team is doing well this season, you can count balls and strikes or batting averages or on-base percentages. Each piece of data is telling part of the story. But you, but you better be sure to count how many runs are on the scoreboard at the end of the game, too, so you know, you know what that final result is. So the, the value of benchmarking rests in its ability to give the big picture of the sector being studied and at the same time, very detailed information about how each participant in the sector might be able to improve financial and operational performance. I think that will become much clearer as my colleagues Chad and Aaron explain the methodology and results of this Food Hub benchmarking study. So uh, Chad, could you describe how this study was done? <clears throat> no problem. Thanks, Gary. Uh, as Gary just discussed, Farm Credit has a history of working on benchmarking projects. In order to garner participants for this study, we reached out to dozens of food hubs across the nation. We made it clear from the beginning that confidentiality for the information submitted was of the utmost importance. Participating hubs signed an agreement form, which was then co-signed by Gary, Aaron, and myself to ensure that only we would see the information. This agreement outlined that the data submitted would be used solely for this benchmarking project and that we would leave all hubs that participated uh, anonymous to the public and even amongst each other. We made sure the hub was completely comfortable disclosing the financial information required for the study before we ever moved forward and asked follow-up questions. Once we had our list of participants, it was on to the collection process. The items we requested from every food hub in the study included their 2011-2012 balance sheets, 2012 income statement, 2012 statement of cash flows, and then a, a set of data questions. In order to better understand each hub's unique model, we asked a series of questions so we could put the numbers in context. Questions included, what year was the hub established? From how far do you source? How much do you spend with your largest 10 vendors? What are your sales dollars to your largest 10 customers? As well as, who do you sell to? Options uh, primarily included restaurants, grocery stores, institutions, direct retail, processors, other distributors, etc. This data helped to better paint the picture of each hub. The key to all the data was accuracy, detail, and organization. We wanted to make sure we knew as much as possible about, as possible about each hub and that we were accurately representing their 2012 financials in the study. There were several calls to clarify points. Like any benchmark, revenue and top line numbers were important, but we really focused on the cost categories and how those dollars were being spent. The data was collected from the participating hubs over the last three months and only focused on the 2012 fiscal year. We received full data submissions from 18 food hubs. However, we were only able to include 15 of those hubs in the benchmark numbers for a variety of reasons, such as lack of detail in their financial statements. Obviously, there were a number of different product mixes and a variety of revenue streams. However, we did our best to compare hubs across the industry on a level playing field by simply looking at their financial performance rather than splitting the hubs into subgroups and looking at them on a micro level. Overall, the team was very impressed with the financial data that we received from participants. By and large, the information received is very detailed and well organized. Lastly, I'd like to thank all the participants in the study. Thank you for your patience over the last few months as I followed up multiple times with clarifying questions. The Food Hub colleagues that I worked with were terrific in their cooperation. The study and its ultimate findings rely on the participation of Food Hubs, so we cannot express our gratitude enough to those of you that were willing to participate. We literally could not have done the study without your help. Thank you again. Now, with that said, I will pass the presentation on to Aaron, who will discuss the actual benchmark results from the study. All right. Thank you very much, Chad. First, I'd like to begin by describing the typical food hub in the benchmark. They have an average age of about 11 years, so obviously some are older and some are younger. The average revenue runs about $1.65 million, and they're open for a business about 300 days per year. Now that speaks to the seasonality. Some are open only seasonal, some are open year-round, depending often on the growing season in the area. So if you analyze your own food hub or if you're working with a food hub and doing some analysis and looking for opportunities for improvement, one of the things to consider might be, do you shut down in slower months to conserve expenses, or do you try to boost sales because you need to cover the overhead in those slow months? 
you need to know what's possible in your own individual situation. It's a great question to investigate using your own good records. You can also start to do some analysis on facilities. The typical food hub that we were looking at has about 9,000 square feet of facility space and two loading docks that help with their delivery fleet, which tends to drive about 54,000 miles per year. Now, many of these food hubs are using local products and only local products, but the definition of local varies depending on who you are and where you are. So on average, they're sourcing products from within 500 miles of where the food hub is located, which is often within their own state, sometimes moving into surrounding states. 20% of our volunteer food hubs are working with strictly organic products. Not to say that the others aren't working with organic products, but 20% have made the rule that their product is strictly organic. 27% of these hubs have some farming activity where they're growing their own products. And a third of the food hubs are buying from their own incubator farmers. Many of these food hubs have community education missions and have programs to teach beginning farmers how to produce and market their agricultural products. These are what we're referring to as the incubator farmers. We looked at a little bit of the organization and how these food hubs operate. As Gary mentioned before, many have a not-for-profit status, I'm just over half, in fact. It's not that they're not making money, but that they have a 501c3 designation from the IRS as a charity and can receive tax-deductible contributions and donations and additional eligibility for certain grant programs. About three-quarters of them take ownership of the products that they resell, as opposed to just acting as a broker or selling on consignment. Two areas where we didn't see a lot of activity are sales from in-house processing. For example, if you buy in tomatoes and make salsa, very little sales were from that kind of activity, and very little sales were from buying and reselling those value-added products, such as that salsa that a farmer makes. Now, these are typically products that yield a higher markup, so that might be something to consider in the product line if you're looking to improve your margin. It's much easier to buy and resell a value-added product than it is to start the processing line yourself, so always consider walking before you run. But it might be an area worth exploring if it's something you're looking to expand your horizons on. Partial budgets are a great tool to investigate such an endeavor. And one other thing we were looking at is if food hubs have a membership structure, and 13% of them charge the fee to their vendors to be part of the food hub, and a full 20% charge the fee to the customers to be able to order from the food hub. One of the biggest questions we were faced with was where do the food hubs get their revenue? Fully 84% came from product sales, so items they were buying and reselling. Another 9% came from grants or contributions, not only for operations, but for special projects, community missions, or just because folks wanted to give some general support to the food hub. 6% came from other enterprises, such as leasing out the delivery fleet in a not so busy season just to help cover some additional costs. Less than 1% of income came from delivery and trucking activities, which begs the question, is this a possible profit center for other hubs? or does it at least have the potential to cover the cost and not be a cost center? Because only two of the hubs that we looked at charged enough for their delivery services to pay for the delivery costs incurred, including labor and trucking costs. Just something to think about as you're doing your own financial analysis. From a financial position perspective, most of the hubs have a decent net worth, just shy of 60% equity. They have some liquidity with a current ratio of 1.6 to 1. Blended debt term at 14 years is quite respectable. And the blended effective interest rate that the hubs are paying is about 1%. The financing is often at these favorable terms because it's coming from an owner, which could be looked at as an equity investor or perhaps some other philanthropist. If businesses that are used to this kind of financing are looking to obtain more commercial credit, of course, market interest rates should be included in the budget. But the opportunity to have such inexpensive capital to start up and continue operations is a benefit that should certainly be used for as long as possible. Aaron, sorry, I, I don't mean to jump in, but can you can you go back a slide? Um, I, I'm, I'm guessing that um, several people uh, don't know how to interpret this 
these uh, metrics. So can you can you just dive a little bit deeper in each one of these? Sure. Net worth is the percent of asset base that is owned outright by the company. So if you own a if you have a hundred dollars in assets and you have a loan for forty dollars, sixty percent of that is the net worth or the equity of the company. Sixty percent of the total asset base. The current ratio is calculated by comparing current assets or things that are readily convertible to cash in the next year, such as cash itself, accounts receivable, perhaps prepaid expenses and supplies, and inventory, divided by the current liabilities. So those expense, excuse me, those liabilities that are going to be incurred within the next year, which are often the accounts payable, accrued expenses, and if you're getting particular, the current portion of any debt payments. Uh, blended debt term is a weighted average on how long it will take to pay off the current loan. So if you have a 30-year mortgage and a five-year equipment loan, what's the weighted average of those? It's going to depend on how what the size of each loan is. And the blended effective interest rate is simply a measure of looking at how much is paid in interest compared to the total debt that a company has. That's a good way to compare rates in actuality when you're quoted a particular rate but maybe some finance charges creep in because you aren't using the terms from your vendors effectively. So just good stuff to keep in mind as you're doing your own financial analysis. Thanks. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we're always questioning is that labor is often a business's biggest or second business biggest expense, and all too often it's one of the first things that is cut in a cost-conscious environment. But many of the businesses we work with are people-based. So how much sense does that make? All too often, it's not that too much money is spent on labor, but it's maybe the efficiency of that labor or what that labor is doing that's the issue. Think about how much time is spent walking on a farm from one end of the field to another, maybe to get a tool, maybe to get a forgotten part, or maybe even to take a bathroom break. That's all time that employees are being paid for. So what if you could speed that up by buying a bicycle? It may cost a few dollars in the beginning, but it would pay for itself quite rapidly. So in addition to looking at money spent on labor, we also look at what time is spent on particular tasks. We use the full-time equivalent measure, which is total hours divided by 2040, or how many hours one is reasonably expected to work in a standard year. Now, some people work harder and put in 3,000 hours, and some people work not as much, put in less time. But the point is we want to be able to compare apples to apples, so we need a standard measure across all of the food hubs to even out the effects of full-time people, part-time people, seasonal people, double-time people, and so on. So in the end, the average food hub had about five full-time equivalent workers on the payroll. These full-time equivalents were made up with about 10 individuals contributing their time. And you'll notice that that says paid equivalents because almost all of the food hubs we looked at use volunteer labor but aren't tracking how much volunteer labor. So while you have the opportunity to use volunteer labor, it would be a real good idea to look at how much time are they spending and on what tasks. Because if you're ever in the position of needing to pay for it, that needs to be able to be in the budget. And you might find when you're ready to hire the next person that if volunteers are covering a particular area, you don't need to hire for that. It's another area where you can further grow and expand. So there's a lot of opportunities for data collection and analysis within any business that can make a huge difference in the bottom line down the road. It's a different mindset than we're most often faced with, but I've seen so many operations where using your records becomes the most profitable tool that you have. So then we started to take a look at where the food hubs are selling their products. As you can see, grocery and food stores is a natural front runner. Restaurants and caterers and other distributors round out almost 85% of sales. Now what you notice about these three sectors is that they are very competitive. That's going to have a downward pressure on pricing. We're also working with very perishable products as we saw before. So there's even more price competition. And that's the nature of agriculture combined with supply and demand. In a bumper crop year, the price is going to be depressed because the supply outpaces the demand. So we expect to see fairly thin margin and a lower markup in a very price competitive environment. So that leads to a different strategy in order to be profitable. 
We also wanted to take a look at how concentrated are our efforts with particular customers and vendors. You can see an average of over 300 customers work with each food hub, but look at the size of the biggest ones. Do you remember the 80-20 rule? Usually it's that 80% of your time is spent on 20% of your customers, for instance. Well, in this case, the largest customer for each food hub makes up about 19% of sales. And the biggest 10 customers account for a full two-thirds of the sales. So that should have you questioning how good your relationships are with your customers. Are these the ones you send holiday gifts to and make time to just stop in and see? How solid a business are they? Because losing one could mean a big hole. So it's a risk mitigation strategy, not just having a good relationship because you like people and realize that business is good for both parties over time, but because you need to do that for the survival and sustainability of your business. You might also consider what your credit policies are. And do you have the working capital to be your customer's bank? Often big customers are looking for terms, such as 30 days on paying bills. But if you don't have enough cash on hand to cover your obligations in the meantime, that's a challenge. And all too often, we'll give those terms just to make additional sales. So just one more thing to think about in your own analyses. Vendors are on a similar plane, but not quite as concentrated. Works with the food hubs work with a smaller number of vendors than customers, likely because of the concentration effect in that multiple uh, stop shopping is available. Farmer vendors make up about 57% of the vendor base. So we're working mainly with farmers when we take a look at these food hubs, and very often farmers are going to have more than one crop to offer, which is important for that one-stop shop effect and efficiency. One interesting point was to see how important food safety is, and fully a third of the food hub volunteers have a certification required of their vendors. Now that can vary from food hub to food hub, and they set what that certification is, but it's important enough that we're seeing it in a measurable number. Again, doing business with vendors is kind of concentrated, certainly not as much as the sales, but we're looking at 16% of our purchases with the largest vendors and half of our purchases with the 10 largest vendors. So if any of them were to disappear, what's the risk mitigation strategy there? Another good question to be asking as you're doing your year-end review. Now this is one of the challenges of a small sample size. You'd love to be able to break the group down to see what the top performers are doing. But that starts to breach confidentiality, among other things. Nevertheless, these are real businesses, real numbers, doing real work. We examine the profit and loss on a weighted average basis and use even dated or even sized statements, meaning as a percent of sales rather than whole dollars, so that you can compare a food hub that's posting $700,000 in sales with one that's posting $2 million in sales on a more apples to apples basis. Now, this is not to say that food hubs barely break even after depreciation, but it's to say that's what the weighted average of this sample said. We did see ranges of up to 22% profitability within the food hubs, and again, that's 22% of sales which is something most people would be ecstatic about. So there are some pretty impressive performers out there. What this does say is that there's a significant amount of overhead created within a food hub. Think about the investment in a physical plant, such as a warehouse, also the trucks or the delivery fleet, that need to be covered by the revenue received after the product costs are paid. How do you do that? The first reaction is always to make it up on volume. I'll sell more stuff. But a better answer is to improve margins, and then you can do more with less. You may still need to grow, but by working smarter, not harder, you'll get there a whole lot quicker. So what this is saying is that for every sales dollar brought in, we're looking at 68 cents of that dollar spent on the cost of procuring the product that is resold. Another 11 cents are spent on organization, packaging, and delivery of that product. That means that 21 cents are left over to cover the overhead in the business. That includes depreciation, which is, of course, not a cash expense, but we do encourage all financial analysis to include the cost of depreciation because physical plants do wear out over time. Trucks need to be replaced, buildings need new roofs, 
And if we don't address this in our profitability analysis of our businesses, we're going to be very surprised down the road when we have to foot the bill for that cost. We also wanted to take a look at some of the operational efficiencies of these businesses. Now, the markup multiple is a comparison of the cost of the product to the price it's sold for. So if you bought a tomato for a dollar, this business, right, which is the average of our benchmark participants, are selling that tomato for $1.24. Now, this is the aggregate of the whole business, so it includes the revenue for all products compared to the cost of all products. Typically, in a retail environment, folks aim to double. Wholesalers usually aim to get one and a half on average. But of course, it depends on the product. And the more perishable that product is, the less of a markup is usually possible. But if your markup is on the low side, there's three places you can start to examine. One, is your pricing appropriate? Local food has a huge following now, and we're seeing customers that are definitely willing to pay more for that. So, are, is there an opportunity on the pricing side? Second, are the costs we're paying for this product appropriate? Or are there better places to get that product? And third, which is the one that sneaks up on most businesses, are we buying in products that we're not getting paid for? It may be produce that spoils. It may be giveaways or samples. It may even be walkaways, which we don't want to think about. It's all right if you make the decision to sample products. In fact, most places encourage that because then it leads to more sales. But the revenue for the ones you do sell need to cover the cost of all of them and then some so you have leftovers for overhead and for profit. Your gross margin is a similar measure of efficiency, but not only does it include what's left over after the cost of the product, but the cost of delivering that product and selling that product as well. And we just saw that in the previous common size income statement, that about 21 cents of every sales dollar is left over to cover overhead and profit. Labor costs, that one question everybody wants the answer to, are running at about 17.5% of sales. However, that doesn't include any of those volunteer figures. Labor costs for a full-time equivalent, so if we were if we were running a business with only full-time employees, we'd be making an average of about $49,000 each. Obviously, that's split among many different people because we saw a lot more bodies than we did see full-time equivalents, but just gives you an idea of where the payroll is running. And one measure that most folks don't really think about but gives a really good indicator of how efficiently your labor is working is what kind of sales each of those equivalents generate. Each full-time equivalent in the food hub is generating almost $287,000 worth of sales. That's pretty impressive. So what do you do with all of these numbers? They give you a basis for comparison, a focus where you can put your time, effort, and energy, all of which is in a limited supply, into the best analysis and planning for your particular business. I like to encourage folks to budget and I've often heard folks say, well, I don't really want to do that because I don't want to see how much money I'm not going to have in six months. So that should beg the question, is that even worth doing in the first place? But the businesses that have a plan, manage to a plan, are the ones that achieve their goals time in and time out. And I like to have folks start at the bottom with what they need to end up with as opposed to taking what's left over. So if you set a profit goal, say it's $50,000, and that profit is used for many things. And it doesn't matter if your status is not for profit or for profit, you still may have bills to pay in terms of loan payments, which are paid for out of profit. You may have investment requirements in the business that you need to pay for. So that's some good things that profitability is used for. Add $50,000 of profit to your overhead expenses. And those don't change all that much from year to year unless you see expansion, maybe hiring another employee that is an overhead category. So in our example, say it's $400,000. That gives you the gross margin dollars needed to hit this profitability target. We're at a total of $450,000. The next step should be to divide the gross margin as a percent of sales into that $450,000 target. That will give us the break-even sales needed to accomplish our profit goal. 
So if we're looking at a 25% gross margin, we simply divide our $450,000 of gross margin needed by 0.25, and that gives us sales needed of $1.8 million. Now you have the basis for a marketing plan. How are you going to hit $1.8 million in sales when you were at $1.6 before or $1.7? You also may investigate an opportunity of what if we were able to improve our margins to save 30%. Do the same math, divide 0.3 into $450,000, and we see that our break-even sales are now only a million and a half. A lot easier target to hit, though we may not be working with every customer because some of them really are looking for the lowest prices. But each of these is a strategy that a business can consider and make the best definition or the best choice for their own. This study has been a great first step in examining the financial trends in the food hub system. I think the biggest thing that we learned was that we want to and need to know more about local food systems from a financial end. These organizations have gone very far with private support. And as emerging sectors grow, the partners, investors, entrepreneurs, and lenders need actionable information to help make that happen with sound financial planning to ensure the continued success and sustainability of the industry. Let's turn it back to you, Jeff, for questions. All right. Um, I have uh, a couple definition questions. Um, okay. One uh, is from this slide here. Um, a couple people were asking, how do you define cost of sales? Cost of sales is going to be anything related to packaging, uh, delivery, and distribution. So the cost of goods is really just the product cost. And the cost of sales is anything else related to getting that product out the door. Okay. Um, another uh, definition question, um, uh, Sarah asks, uh, what is an owner incubated farm? I think, it's, I, I think she's talking about uh, a farmer incubator. That is where many of these food hubs have a community mission where they want to teach people how to start raising and marketing their own products. So you as a beginner farmer would go work with a food hub, perhaps rent or perhaps use some of the land owned by the food hub or a partner of the food hub. And basically they would help cultivate you and your business. Mm -hmm. okay. And of course the product gets sold through the food hub. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Chad, maybe a question for you. Um, can you uh, uh, characterize where the 15 hubs uh, that were part of the study are? Are they uh, mostly in the northeast or spread evenly across or m mostly in two regions? Yeah, no problem. Um, due to obviously the confidentiality and, and, and all that that we um, had the food hub sign and want to make sure that uh, they remain anonymous, we can't get into it too much unfortunately, but um, but. Uh, the most I guess we can say is that uh, invitations were sent uh, across the country, uh, like I said, to dozens of food hubs, and the amount of food hubs that we ended up receiving data from represented that, uh, I guess, sample size that um, we received basically uh, feedback from from everywhere across the U.S. No international food hubs, but uh, but from the East Coast to the West Coast, uh, we had, uh, and like I think I mentioned in one of my earlier slides as well, that. Uh, not only the for-profit and non-profit, but uh, many different product mixes, as you can imagine, um, whether it's uh, fruits and vegetables or whether it's beef, um, maybe even both, that um, stretching across the country, we, we kind of saw it all. So I guess that's as, <laughs> that's as uh, unfortunately, as uh, deep as we can get into who is involved. Okay. Um, sure. Um, there are several uh, questions from people asked in various ways, but uh, essentially the question is, how indicative are the averages? Um, there, there are several people on on the webinar who uh, have a have a sense that uh, averages and medians, and there could be multiple modes. You know, that uh, an average is just uh, one snapshot. So, um, can you just give a sense and and uh, you know, understanding that we are talking about relatively small numbers. Um, but are, are the averages a, a, a good indication or, or a decent indication? 
They're a good indication of this peer group because that, again, is one of the issues with the small sample size. And again, these are real businesses with real numbers. Certainly, we'd love to have more in perhaps a future iteration. Um, so it's not representative, I would say, of the entire food hub sector, but certainly of this peer group who, again, are real businesses making a real good go of it out there. And again, thanks to, to them for sharing their data with us. And, and just to add to that, Jeff, uh, if there were more participants, then the, the next step to do with a benchmarking study would be to say, OK, so what do the top 25% of food hubs, the most 25% that are most profitable, what do they do that's different than everybody else? What, what ratios change? Is their overhead uh, lower? Uh, what's different? And the problem with a small sample size is, is that when you take out the top 25% in a sample of 15, you end up with too few to be able to say that's, that's really a reliable number. Um, so that's, the, the, that's our pain point here is you know, we, we put the effort into the study. And unfortunately, um, we got great, well, fortunately, we got great information. Unfortunately, it was from uh, not enough participants to be able to be statistically sound or to be able to maintain the confidentiality of, of those participants because we'd be reporting a number that was 25% of too small a number. That's, that's where we are with these, uh, presenting these as an average. Well, so let me, uh, let me jump on that point and launch a little poll here. Um, uh, please feel free to uh, grab your mouse and, and vote. Um, uh, this is asking, uh, would you uh, either participate or be willing to encourage a food hub in your area to participate in a, uh, a second benchmarking study uh, in early 2014? So uh, not, not too far away. Um, so uh, go ahead and vote. Um, meanwhile, um, there's an interesting question about uh, are there uh, publicly available benchmarking studies for more conventional uh, food aggregation and distribution uh, businesses that we can compare um, food hubs to? Absolutely. The land grant universities are really good resources for that kind of information. It's usually a little bit in arrears in terms of you're not looking at 2012 data yet, uh, but those are really good resources. Um, I don't know off the top of my head where I would direct you for a specific uh, sort of food distribution, um, but start with the land grant universities because uh, between all of them, there are definite resources for any kind of crop you're looking to grow, including some of the more unique and ones that are, are new to our food systems. There, uh, Jeff, there are um, industry trade associations that frequently will do uh, benchmarking studies of whatever industry they're in, whether it's, I don't know, making uh, electrical tools or uh, uh, distributing wholesale food. Um, and the, the problem with those studies is that it's, it's uh, uh, frequently quite expensive in the thousands of dollars to get access to that report from the trade association as far as uh, what some other related industry that would be significant to know about. Uh, uh, those, those studies often cost quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. um, United Fresh uh, is um, uh, about to carry out a benchmarking study with distributors. Um, so just as, as you were talking about this trade association. Uh, please continue to, to vote. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, let's see. Um, there's a, a question from Bob about um, what is the sourcing distance referred to? So is that the average maximum distance from the hub to the furthest farm, or that um, the a average distance from hubs to their farms? What, what does that statistic mean? Yeah, good. It is the maximum distance from which they take product. So we're looking for these local products. Again, that definition varies, so we ask them to put it into miles. So if I'm sitting here in Connecticut, my sourcing distance is probably going to be less than 100 miles because I want to keep it within uh, the boundaries around me. OK. Um, um, and to add one more thing, Jeff, sure. onto yeah, sure. Aaron, Aaron. Yeah. Jeff, just one thing real quick. And to add on to Aaron's response is, is um, 
in the data questions that I gave a short sampling of, not only that sourcing question, but we also asked, um, uh, what's your definition of local? And that was uh, not to uh, not to see if the local definition matched up with ours and tell them they're right or wrong, but just to see how that matched up with their sourcing to say their local definition is within state lines and then their sourcing definition is within state lines or it, they, they don't adhere to that, just to see how closely, um, kind of as Aaron just mentioned about, depending on your location, um, how far uh, different hubs needed to go in order to source, even if they even if their definition of local was slightly different. Great, thanks. Um, Rich asks, uh, what are the next steps with the results? For example, will there be a publication with further analysis uh, or outreach materials? Well, we, we expect to uh, write a, a short paper so that this is available uh, in a more condensed form than these PowerPoint slides. Um, the uh, uh, obviously, we can't go into a whole lot more detail than than what we have in the in the PowerPoint slides, but um, I think it just a, a, the nature of this information. Uh, hopefully, we're hopefully we're communicating with people in this webinar and with that uh, anticipated paper, uh, communicating with people that are in the local food business that need a need a stake in the ground uh, of what a food hub business might look like and uh, even though we were uh, we didn't get a sample size large enough to uh, to report in the way that we would have liked with greater detail um, still I think that there's a lot of value in having gone through this the exercise of getting the real business data in and analyzing uh, that data to get these uh, ratios and comparisons that Aaron went through in order to have uh, just a, a good sense of how we can describe food hubs. Uh, what is the best way to describe a business's operations in terms of potential profitability, that sales per worker, that kind of thing that's not necessarily something that's top of mind when you're doing a business plan, but is uh, a very good way to compare uh, businesses that might be of very different size and scope or have a different business model. So we, we look forward to, to publishing something, uh, publishing a paper that, that has information that is going to be able to uh, help define what we should be looking at when we're uh, trying to describe food hubs as a sector. Great. Good. Um, Sarah asks, uh, were there any additional data gathered on non-financial metrics, for instance, uh, environmental sustainability measures? Um, I, I'm, I'm going to answer that. Um, the answer is n no. Uh, however, um, there was a, uh, a second uh, a study um, from the NGFN Food Hub Collaboration led by uh, Michigan State University. Um, uh, that did ask questions like this, um, as well as some, some financial questions that were uh, asked in a different way. Um, and the results of those study, uh, that study uh, is the topic of uh, next month's webinar. So mark your calendars uh, and uh, go ahead and, and tell us that you want us to sign you up uh, in, this, in the post-webinar survey um, and you, you'll automatically be signed up for next month's webinar uh, for those um, Trust me, very exciting results. Um, uh, there was a, a question, uh, and uh, just say, can't, can't do that uh, if this violates confidentiality, but uh, there is a question if there were any um, uh, public markets or, or other markets, uh, hubs that are um, really only charged like stall fees uh, and have other vendors working out of the, the market. Good question, and that was one that we felt wasn't uh, a similar model as folks that are actually buying and reselling product or even brokering product. So uh, folks like that were not included. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, uh, there's a question, uh, were older food hubs more efficient in terms of labor? Right? You were talking about that's a, that's a key um, uh, 
area where um, sort of current weakness, um, but was was the effect uh, better um, for the older hubs? Uh, that was a very good question, and again, too small a sample size to say what's older versus what's not. But one thing that we did notice was that the older food hubs were definitely profitable food hubs. Um, and of course, that just speaks to the fact that if you're going to be here for a long time, you're definitely doing something right. 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 Yeah, there's, isn't, there's, um, there's probably also an effect of uh, um, refining your systems over, over time. So if, um, so oh, sure, and taking in taking into account what you've learned and applying it to do even better next year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, let's see. Uh, were were there uh, any results that um, that surprised you, uh, or or sort of um, when when you're going into this, you, your uh, your notions were had to be adjusted. can't speak for Gary and Chad, but when we start with a new benchmark, we try not to have any expectations because we're never sure what we're going to find. Uh, so if something surprises us as we're looking through the data, then we go back and, of course, recheck the calculations. Um, I think the one that Chad and I were curious about was, um, you know, just what kind of growing practices folks have and uh, how important was that in a decision to be a food hub. So uh, we checked on that a couple of times and uh, it is what it is, but for the most part, you know, any kind of new business obviously is in a different position than an older business, and uh, we did have a, a neat sample of, though it being small, folks that have been in business for many years versus those that were just starting up. So I'm excited to see what the future may bring if folks are interested to know more and see what a different year brings. <laughs> Me too. Um, uh, when you were analyzing the markets, you mentioned that um, uh, uh, something like 80% of the markets were r relatively low-value markets. Um, it, now, looking now into in sort of uh, individual hubs, were the hubs that focused on the higher-end markets did they tend to be more profitable? I don't think there's enough data to say for sure. Um, just think about the different business structures. If you invest a lot in your overhead and your plant, then you're obviously going to have to ha hit a higher break-even target, and you can get there sooner by having a higher margin. Uh, but you could also just grow to be a very, very lean and mean efficient machine that provides the same dollars of gross margin but with a much bigger top line. Uh, so again, just too small a sample to say whether the higher margin makes it or breaks it in this particular type of business. But just thinking about what you know about any wholesale environment, it does tend to be leaner uh, than a fancy retail environment. OK. OK. Uh, Chad, how many hubs were invited to participate? Um, and there's actually, let me just, uh, uh, there's also a question about how many hubs uh, are there in the US. Um, uh, I, we have a list of about 200 on foodhub.info, um, and that, that same list is also on uh, the USDA Food Hub website, um, and the uh, Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food Compass. Um, uh, but um, we are sure that there are hubs that exist that we don't know about, uh, and we have we are watching uh, several hubs in the emerging stage, so uh, they're, they're coming up. But Chad, um, how many hubs uh, received an invitation, roughly? Yeah, I, I, I don't have the exact number for me, but I believe it was somewhere around um, 50 to 60 uh, by the end of it when we were reaching out to different folks and getting interest from, from others that at least wanted to, uh, to see the invitation um, and, and see what was requested and that sort of thing. So I, I think the final number of total invitations that went out was, um, was around 50 or 60. And to, to add on to that, Jeff, it, I, I think we would have been a lot more comfortable if we had had uh, 30 participants in being able to start segmenting the, the, uh, uh, the group into a uh, top 25 percent and being able to compare those who had been in business longer to those that 
haven't that those kinds of comparisons require a, a, a comfort level at, at 30 would have been great uh, and uh, anything less than that gets starts to get a little bit dicey when you get to small numbers and I, I know it's frustrating for uh, for those on the webinar to hear us keep saying gosh it was too small a sample size uh, but uh, I guess you know maybe I'm just an optimist but I think it's better to light a, a small candle than just continue to curse the darkness of, of not knowing anything uh, from a broad or at least a nationwide sample of, uh, of food hubs. I think the other point too is that these are really great questions that are coming up. Maybe things that we've thought of and things that we certainly haven't thought of. So keep the questions coming to Jeff, to Gary, to Chad, to myself. So if we are able to do this again, uh, then we have a few more uh, things to investigate. That's a great point. That's a great point. And um, there were several people who said, we're a food hub, we're in for the early 2014 study, and uh, many more who said that there would round up volunteers. So uh, we're going to hold you all to it. Um, please, uh, you'll, you'll get an email from us uh, when, when we're ready. Um, the the definition of the uh, food hub is, is up on your screen now. Um, someone was asking, what is the the difference between a food hub and uh, a, a produce distributor. Um, and um, we think the, the definition touches upon uh, the fact that we're talking about source verification, we're, we're talking about a commitment to uh, local and regional food, uh, and we're talking about a, a sort of a, a long term, um, if I can drop a term, of a value chain um, uh, uh, to a commitment to transparency and and a, and a commitment to marketing uh, the their the local food as as local food and and getting a price premium often off of that. Um, and Jeff, I think it's I think it's important to note that uh, that term value chain has the word value in it, of course. But as, as I describe this definition, it really has a component of mission. There's a sense of mission in here that's based in in shared values, and I think that that concept of shared values is a, um, I mean, it's hard to define in economic terms, but from a sense of consumer behavior, uh, shared values is something that's worth money. Uh, it is, uh, and, and maybe that sounds too cynical, but people are willing to spend money to be able to say, um, I want to know where my food came from. It's as simple as that. That's an example of shared values, which, in a in a larger macroeconomic sense, has value in the marketplace. And that's a that's a difference right there between a, a food wholesaler or a produce wholesaler and a food hub. Okay. Yeah. That's an excellent. Excellent point, Carrie. Um, Robin asks a, another specific question here. Um, can you clarify whether the average employee is paid 48000 a year or whether that covers the salary and taxes and workers' comp and health insurance and all that, sort of the, the full, the fringe as well? Oh, great question. Yes, that covers all of the costs of that employee to the business. But keep in mind, that is the typical full-time employee. So it's not an individual person. Uh, but if you have two part-time people or two people that work seasonally, uh, that would include any you know, overtime that's paid as well. But just to give a common measure across all food hubs who have some part-time people, some extra time people, et cetera, uh, that's a real good measure to evaluate that. OK. Um, uh, there's a question. Uh, about the range of fees charged to producers and customers, and um, I, you, you may not have the the data in front of you, but it but it is a it's definitely that's a hot question when people are designing their food hub. They of course mm -hmm. want to maximize the return for their their producers. That is the nature of of a food hub, um, and yet uh, they have to they have a marketplace to compete in. Um, so, is there a sense of uh, the the range? Um, of the fees charged to the producers and the customers, basically the, the, the range of the margin. Sorry. We didn't ask that one. I just wrote that down because we weren't even sure how many folks were charging. And you could see, I think it was 13% uh, were charging 
vendor fees and 20% customer fees. So um, that would be a good one for future questions. Um, all right. Uh, Gary, I'm thinking um, just just knowing you, there's uh, there's something that you'd probably like to say um, to, to, to close us out in summary. <laughs> well, the, uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, no problem. I, I, think, I think what we've uh, accomplished here is, is less than we had hoped, but certainly more than we knew when we started. Uh, and the uh, uh, part, of, part of the reason for, for doing this this investigation um, is really to share knowledge uh, among the, 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 the farmers who sell to a food hub so that they can assess the risk of doing business with a food hub, for the food hubs to understand how they may be, might be able to improve uh, their, their business operations, improve their profitability, and to uh, what I would assume is much of our audience, um, people who are involved in local foods in, a, in one way or another as uh, policy uh, advocates um, or uh, people who want to understand this emerging sector of agriculture. And I think we've, what we've been able to do internally, that kind of behind the curtains thing that may not be evident, is really generate a lot of interest and excitement within uh, our institution of farm credit to be able to uh, to be able to, to go to people and say, yeah, we're trying to figure this out, um, and that's that uh, by by asking the question and uh, asking uh, farm credit institutions across the country if if they might be able to uh, recommend a food hub that would participate in this study, we've really spread the uh, the idea that this is an emerging market and it's worth studying and it is part of the local food system that is here to stay. Uh, we just need to figure out uh, uh, a little bit better with a bigger sample size some more detail about about how it works uh, in its in its finer details. And I think that's something that that uh, isn't isn't part of, of what we reported today and it's certainly anecdotal, but I'd like to like people to know that that the commitment to understanding this business is one that we're uh, we're going to follow through on. Great. Well, thank you uh, to Chad and Gary and Aaron. Um, excellent presentation and and excellent work on the the benchmarking study. Um, I I also want to uh, thank our participants for the very very many questions and uh, have a, offer an apology that we weren't able to get to so many of them, uh, but they were uh, really good and uh, we will we will try uh, to address some of them um, in uh, uh, certainly in in the the next webinar we'll. Uh, we'll address some of these questions um, and um, maybe we'll, we'll work on uh, uh, incorporating these questions as uh, as we write up uh, the, uh, this this report um, but I also really uh, want to thank um, the food hub uh, the, the participants uh, who, who these 15 hubs 18 hubs who are uh, so, uh, so willing to be uh, transparent food hubs are a burgeoning business model and really, as a whole, we're just learning how to how to make this work. Um, taking time out to participate in valuable studies like this and being transparent that with data that many are uncomfortable sharing uh, is really helping to move the needle to selling more good good food. So, uh, hubs out there, if you found value in this study, please do consider responding to uh, upcoming studies. Um, funders, if this study helps shape your understanding, please consider supporting the hubs time it takes to participate in these uh, in these surveys um, and researchers just let us know uh, how would you like to help to continue uh, our understanding of food hubs working together we will get better faster okay
The uh, NVFN uh, has had a monthly webinar series since June 2009. That's a lot of webinars, and they're all recorded and archived on our website at ngfn.org slash webinars. We have our archive organized by topic and date, so dig in. Treat yourself to another hour of professional development this week. Our webinars are the third Thursday of each month, generally starting at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, noon 30 Pacific. In September, we will present the results of an analysis of a large food hub study run by the Michigan State University's Center for Regional Food Systems in collaboration with the Wall Center and the NGFN Food Hub Collaboration. There are other financial questions answered by that survey, which had over 100 participants, but the range of questions is quite different. This is a, a state of the food hub presentation, including the impacts hubs are having, the variety of models, how much local food they're actually moving, and much more. And in October, we're collaborating with the National School Food Network on National Farm to School Month to present how food hubs are assisting with moving healthy local food into schools. There are some schools where uh, some schools where food service can buy directly from farms, but most require the aggregation and distribution logistics of a food hub to make a, a program actually feasible. So join us in October for uh, some interesting success stories. Uh, you can let us know in the post-webinar survey if you'd like to be automatically registered for either of these uh, uh, next webinars or, or both. Um, I want to let you know about a couple other Wallace Center websites. Foodhub.info .info, uh, is a food hub hub of information, research, case studies, a map of many of the food hubs across the country. Uh, the NGFN Food Hub Collaboration is working closely with nine food hubs across the country to document their stories, read about our study hubs on our site. There are even links to TA providers with experience in aggregation and distribution. The NGFN Food Hub Collaboration is, a, uh, is building a uh, community of practice, of food hub managers and staff, and food hub supporters as well. We have a newsletter about every other month, technical assistance and networking opportunities and more. In, also in the post-webinar survey, you can indicate to us if you'd like more information about this community of practice. Foodshedguide.org is our site for producers wanting to adapt to the changing food business landscape. We have instructive text and case studies and an emphasis on how to have a viable business in a food value chain. Uh, learn about, for instance, factors to consider when deciding on legal status, such as LLC or C Corp. Visit foodshedguide.org for more. There are several case studies on, on food hubs. Um, you can get a, a good example there. Examples. Uh, you can find the NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, on our website, ngfn.org. The Wallace Center is also on Facebook. Come like us. Search for Wallace Center at Winrock International. Again, if you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage, or just let us know in that post-webinar survey. We'll, we'll sign you up. Uh, contact us at any time. Our email address is contact at ngfn.org. The NGFN would like to thank you uh, for your time today. Once again, let me encourage you to fill out that survey. It'll open your web browser in just a moment. And this concludes the webinar.